yeah. Our thing oh, is yeah. <laughs> Look at us. Here we are in air conditioning, dancing. Yeah. Thank right. goodness. Right. Yes. Tomorrow. Hello, everybody. Welcome to If These Walls Could Talk. I am Wendy Stewart. And, and I'm Tim Moss. Yes. Hi, everyone. How are you enjoying yourself in this balmy, balmy weather? Well, I am in front of the air conditioner. Like you said, that's where I'll be today. There, there I have to run go. out in a little while, but yeah, I'll be out in it the next few days. So. But you have, you've got a road trip coming up to Rhode Island. Yes. Yeah. Actually, tomorrow we go to Providence, Rhode Island. We have a show tomorrow night. We're doing Lube, which Lube. is a parody of Grease Lube. <laughs> and it's pretty nasty, but it's so much fun. It's very, It's hysterical. Of course it's nasty, but you love nasty. It's Ica Belli. It's Ica <laughs> Belli and Tim Moss, of course. We love Ica Belli. We love nasty. It's, <laughs> it's, it's all very good. But yep. uh, this Sunday, for any of you listening, if you are in New York, uh, the Imperial Court is doing a fundraiser for Bailey House at Industry Bar on 52nd mm -hmm. Street. And the show is called, what is the show called? Oh, <laughs> Thank you, Alan. There's Alan, my husband in lighter. He lights our set. Christmas in July. You see oh, the yes, right. we're doing Christmas in July. And of course, um, everything the Imperial Court does is to benefit uh, another non-for-profit organization. They do incredible work. I have written a string of six original parodies that I will be performing there. So if you are in New York, our doors open at five. This show starts at six and I guarantee you, you will laugh your socks off. So there. Yeah. Unfortunately, I'm going to be coming back from Rhode Island. Missing so I'm you. not going to be able to get there. But last year, Jed oh Ryan God. and I helped you out on one of your songs in Christmas in July. It, it was so I funny. I was the naughty Santa. To, to, right. I <laughs> you remember this song. I saw daddy kissing Santa Claus. Yeah. <laughs> And Tim was right. Of course, Tim loves being Naughty Santa. Let's just I talk do. about that a little bit. We're talking yeah. about Christmas. You love being Naughty Santa. So yeah. we are coming to you live today from Pangea. And if again, if you are in New York, Friday night, my husband's show, he's got some artwork up here. We're having a little cocktail party from 6 to 8. If you would like to join us, uh, we will have hors d'oeuvres and a cash bar. And in the cabaret room, before the guest even comes on, I'm not telling you his name yet, is a wonderful, wonderful exhibit from our guest who's on today. And he'll be talking more about it. Yay! And let me think what else is coming up. Tonight, my um, show, Triversity Talk, is got Dwayne Brown, who is a social worker, who'll be discussing the challenges of really keeping sane in the LGBTQ community uh, with everything that's going on right now, right? right? And uh, my co-host, of course, is the fabulous Evan Lawrence, who we have the best producer, writer, designer. I, you know what? We all wear all hats. And speaking of all hats, my my two guests today, my God, they- Hold, hold just one yes. second. I just wanted to say um, uh, this last weekend I hosted, I was one of the hosts of Bronx Pride. <laughs> and it was absolutely wonderful day. Um, just such a celebration. At one point in the afternoon, it just poured rain and- Nobody wanted to go on to perform. So I just grabbed the microphone and walked out. And I said, I feel like Diana Ross in Central Park. I love it. And, and saying, um, I want to dance with somebody. And we had an I absolute it. ball. It was wonderful. So we're dancing in the rain. And then it, oh, it was an amazing, it was a very memorable day. It was very, very fun. And you know what was memorable for me? Because I wasn't there. You put up a video of you and Ricky Velez doing yes. it. What's Singing, um, yeah, um, Enough is Enough, the enough Barbara Streisand, Donna Summer duet, yeah. I so, was Barbara, of course. Okay, I was going to ask you which one you were, <laughs> but I, I have to tell you, I totally loved it. You can find it on Tim's page. It was it was just really great. And um, kudos to Apollonia Cruz for producing yes. this. She's amazing. Now, um, also, I just wanted to say earlier today, I don't know, it kind of, it flashed in my head. I was like, wow, I guess I am a New Yorker. Um, I've lived here for 40 years, but I had like about a half an hour. I had 20 minutes to a half an hour and I was like, Qu good, I can lay down, get a quick nap. And just as I was dozing off, I realized there was a jackhammer going on outside, which is still going on. So you might hear it. There was a jackhammer going on outside. A siren went by and I had my TV on. I was like, yeah, I'm a New Yorker. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> the jackhammer is what really counts. I can put up with almost anything, but you know, to Tim's point, we had that in front of our building for actually two months. Oh, and I real, it was absolutely positively awful. There's yeah. nothing worse than a jackhammer. You're, you're like, I did. Honestly, I didn't even hear it. I didn't, I'm didn't so used it. to it. I didn't even hear the jackhammer. I didn't hear the siren. I didn't, it just, it was all kind of in the peripheral. And I was like, yeah, I'll just sleep. I can sleep through anything in this town after living in this town for 40 well, years. There you go. You know what they say about people like us when we go out to the country, like we're up all night oh. we sleeping and the quiet is so bad. Right. It is. The quiet is so loud. Well, I'm <laughs> very yes, our guest today. To introduce our, our guest today. Um, mm. They too have been in New York for, for decades. Mm -hmm. They are what I would call an artistic dream team. We have Leon Waller with a current show at Pangea. It's called The Water in Place. And Leon's work is in public collections, private collections, corporate collections, has a legacy of museum and educational positions. And the other half of the team, Wendell Walker, has created over 45 years of beautiful exhibition and design, most recently at the Museum of the Moving Image. So they, they you know what, they are the nuts and bolts of what it is to be an artist. So let yeah. me bring them right on right now. Come on, everybody, slide. This is what we do here. We slide on in. I got to get everyone in the Leon, Leon Waller and Wendell Walker. Yay! Yay! How are you? I, you know, I have to tell you, um, Wendell is my nickname. <laughs> Really, it is it's my I or when or I'll how win about win oh I gotta get yep yeah, we gotta sit over a little more there we, there we go all right are we all in is yeah, everybody yeah. in yay there we go um, I was gonna say I've also been called Wendy before <laughs> okay I, to I totally Wendell, Wendy, you know right I totally there. wasn't <laughs> expecting that I didn't think that Wendy would tell me he was called Wendy, Wendy. before <laughs> okay I'm Wendy Ann you weren't called Wendy Ann. No, no, okay. No, okay. Never, I never went that far. Little closer together. Okay, we're good now. Are we? Are we all in? Yeah. Yep. This is the challenges of streaming, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> yes. yes. We, we, you know, we have this little green eye that we all all talk to. Well, I'm really, really happy to have you both here today. Uh, the timing on this show, of course, is perfect because Leon's show is here yeah. in the cabaret room at uh, Pangea. But Leon, you have such a, a history of coming to New York in the 70s, yeah? 75. 1975, wow. Uh -huh. I came in 76, uh -huh. so we're uh -huh. all still here. We're all we're all standing. Um, how did you get involved in the arts? Um, I think since childhood. My family had art or drawing competitions in, in Virginia. Oh, wow. And oh. I, I, would, I would compete with my cousins. I love drawing. it. Uh -huh. And my mother inspired me because she was the most talented person and do it in coloring coloring books and it started probably there in my childhood so your mother started you with, with coloring books at a young age and well uh, she colored herself and i was uh -huh. stunned by how beautiful she could lay down a layer of color what um her hand was just the pressure was even the layer of color was beautifully done and it like inspired me saying i want to do that one day I oh. want to be able to do it that well. And you can tell this guy is a real artist. He um, used two words, layer, <laughs> okay, and pressure. And right. we'll talk about more, more of that later because it's definitely in your in your work. You right. can see that that's there. So you started out that way. Yeah, I'm self-taught as a artist. Um, as I did not go to art are. school, but uh, my degree was in elementary education. Wow. And so I spent a lot of time teaching uh, young people, children, how to draw and paint. I love it. Um, at the museums I work with. And one of the issues that um, when I was in, in elementary education in college, my professors thought, okay, you're going to teach in elementary school. And I said, no, I'm not going to get certified. I want to teach anyone who's learning something for Love the first this. time. That wow. whether it's a child or an adult, that is elementary education. Right, right. Well, you know what? That. Yeah, you knew exactly. And, and you, this was in Virginia, correct? You went. To, it was in Virginia, in um, uh -huh. ECU, Virginia Commonwealth University, uh -huh. as well as college. Wow. And I also worked at John B. Carey Elementary School as an intern, and um, taught dance as well as other forms of the art arts. to children. Right, right. Uh -huh. 
I, you know, it's interesting because what your mother did was inspire you right. to pass it down. And, and that's what you did. Yes. What was the deciding factor to come up to New York? Cause obviously you love working with kids. You were doing that where you came from. Right. What made you come up here? Theater. Ah, theater. <laughs> <All right. laughs> I was, I, at the time I was a playwright and I was writing uh, plays inspired by William Butler Yeats and the Japanese no theater. And I came up basically to get mm -hmm. into theater. I had acted also, and I was teaching modern dance, and so I was very much involved in all aspects of, of, of the arts. Yeah, um, uh, that always is so, so impressive to me, Tim. You know, we have people come on, and you think they're coming on. You know, they have one focus. Mm -hmm. You have all, all of these different focuses, and you're living what it is that you are, which is great. When I was younger, I got involved in many aspects of art. Um, as at this time in my life, I'm focusing on the visual arts. The visual arts. And I have improved my ability to draw, hopefully my ability to paint as well. Right. Um, because I'm focused now. This is what I want to do. I want to paint. I want to paint well. Uh -huh. Now, we have Wendell Walker here with a, <laughs> a, a, a background in also the visual arts. Yes. You start, you've been here 45 years? Yeah. Do I have the number? In, yes, yeah. 77. Well, wow, we all came we, at the same time. <laughs> and we met right after I moved here. And of course, our story about how we met at the Whitney Museum. Um, I, okay, I, I totally yes. love this. Tell us the story of how you met. Of course, you met at the Whitney. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the painting, um, the, the image that you used in the promo for yeah, this. Yeah, there is it, in the middle. Yeah, yeah. So that's the painting um, that um, that we met over, literally. Um, oh, and we, yes, um, so, so we were at the Whitney Museum. I'd gone there. It was, I just moved to New York. I'd been here about a month and I was living in a residency hotel. Oh, um, I, I remember Street. those. Yeah, we all did that. <laughs> on 23rd, Tim, do you remember those? Oh, yeah. I was, yeah, I was in a few of them. Yeah. Right, yeah, these, yeah. And you had a tiny little room yeah, in yeah. a residency. In a shared bathroom. Right. Yep. 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 So I'd gone out, you know, it was like, I, I'd had a rough week trying to get, you know, work and figure out my life in New York. Right. I just come here, you know, crazy mm -hmm. idea I had to come to this crazy city and i decided to go to the whitney for the day and i went there and oh, this um, is meant to be. and i'm gonna walk up and there's um it's a paul cadmus painting of course it was a very well-known um, gay artist, gay artist yeah um, of mm -hmm. an era when artists were not out and but he was right um but we um we, we walked up this painting at the same time and we just looked at it together and looked at each other and smiled oh and, um, Hmm. Thought, uh, you know, a little humor with the painting, whatever, and then um, went our separate ways and then um, reconnected in front of a um, Helen Frankenthaler painting. Get out! <laughs> <It's> like... <laughs> and Leanne started talking to me then, and he had uh, come to, um, there's, a, there's a story behind this story. He had um, met a, another person, a friend who became a very good friend of ours um, from Sweden, a Swedish diplomat, and um, Leanne also was homeless at the time. I was living in Sutton Place. <laughs> oh, <that's right. laughs> I, I love, I love yeah. this. Yeah. Wendell says he was place. homeless. Leon says he was living on Sutton Place. That's well, he was staying in there. Yeah. So anyway, <laughs> he was collecting unemployment at the same God time. God damn, yeah. Leon was living large. Wendell, uh, don't yes. try and make it <laughs> for you. But you were in a little room. He yeah, had found yeah. out yeah, a way no, to he, beat yeah. this. Yeah, I was going to say, if you're homeless, <laughs> if you're homeless. If you're homeless, that's the way to do it. Yeah. <laughs> right? yeah, with unemployment. Gorgeous yeah, yeah, apartment yeah, with yeah. Buco Bucks. I, I, couldn't, I, I couldn't justify my address to the people downtown giving me unemployment. Right, <laughs> I will. Yeah. 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 That is really but Leon didn't want his friend to know we just met, but he wanted mm -hmm. me to join him for lunch. So he said, just pretend we were old friends and we just met. So, so you had to so, make up the. So I, I joined he and these friends for lunch, and throughout the lunch, we made up all these stories about our, about our old friendship that it never. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> so wait, no, we, we definitely we to do this. Where did you tell like your host where the, you had met? What did you What did you say? And do you remember the details of it? I, I think there was some story that we had met in, in where you were somewhere in, up in Westchester because you've been working in Westchester. And yeah, you know, the for this whole media and. and um, yeah. There, and, you know, it was all made up stuff. Completely we fabricated. Through. Yeah, right. I think I think we kind of focused on us be, both being Southerners. I think that's what it was. <laughs> yeah, we're yeah, both, yeah. I was yeah. from Virginia. He was from Mississippi, but we had known each other. You know. But and of course, your host from being up here didn't see through this fabricated right. story. <laughs> right. so we phone numbers, and I departed. And then the next day, I called Leon and. Uh, basically moved into Sutton Place within the next Okay, day get I out! <laughs> 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 
And actually, yeah. the, the Bjorn, who was it was his apartment on Sutton, Sutton Place, um, well, he he got sort of tired of this situation. At one point, he would you know asked us to leave. Um, this is not going to work out. And that night, he had some kind of an attack. And seizure, he had, yeah. He had a seizure. We had to take him to the emergency room, and it was a horrible oh, drama. He was like, okay, well, you don't have to move out yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you were there. So then we found a place to live in in the East Village. You, we, you, yeah, you guys we, did. We you know what I love so much about this story, Tim? <laughs> this is the kind of stuff that happens when you come to New York when you're in your 20s. Yeah, right? absolutely. There's always yes. some rich person right. involved. <laughs> Nobody's really working or making any money, but they find a way to tap dance yeah, yeah, yeah. you know yeah. into like a great apartment and a great existence without having a pot to piss in or a window to throw it out that's of but right. you yeah. did it yeah, yeah. and yeah. new york was something of a frontier then that's when the new, was new right. york was going yeah. through bankruptcy yeah. and all that yeah and, yeah, and, yeah. And there were muggings everywhere and you had to yep. fall on the streets or in elevators well yeah. um yeah, yeah. 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 new york new york city was new york city was brutal at that time it was like you said the the muggings it was very dangerous it was um, very and kind of inexpensive, but it was also uh, you had to be on your guard twenty four seven. Yeah, well, I, it was a I different New York City than what it is today. Here in Pangea, I was talking to a young woman who did not understand when you get in the elevator, you had these metal mirrors in the corners, right? Oh, and right. How, right. So, and so no one could. She never. She oh, I use those. She used to look at that, and, and we did it in the past. You look at that mirror before you got into an elevator. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. People have forgotten that. They no. just see these and they're like, yeah. what, what are they for? Right. <laughs> right. That well, New York in the seventies. It, it's interesting because I was talking with uh, Stephen, one of the owners of Pangea, and I said it's amazing that so many people in the East Village are our friends now, and I don't understand why Alan and I, you know, we were here in the seventies. We didn't come to the East Village. We were in the twenties. Mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't come to the East Village for everything that Leon. I had. Two friends slashed down here, not to yeah. mention that, uh, yeah, East Village was like rough. With, with scars, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. not to mention the muggings. It was really dicey. Lots of drugs, people uh, mm -hmm. squatting in, yeah. in buildings. When yeah. we were talking about that with Steve before you came here, he had friends that had an amazing loft they had fixed up in a building that nobody was paying any rent in. Right. <laughs> yeah. There's always every weekend there's always a car left burning in the middle of the street. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That had been stolen by the gunshots nightly. Right. Yeah, gunshots, yep. Nightly gunshots. But oh, this takes me back. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I know, I know. Oh, wait, I need a tissue. I'm gonna cry. Nostalgia. So um it's interesting because you could have chosen everywhere, but you chose here. Why do you, what was it about the East Village in the 70s that made you think if you can make it here, I can make it anywhere? Yeah. Well, you know, I actually came here for a very specific purpose. I had gotten an internship. I studied traditional African art. In oh, college, I love this, right? Which was not a uh, field considered part of art history at the time. Now right. it is. At the time, uh -huh. uh, traditional African art, you studied through anthropology th at that that's, time. That's how I studied yeah, it. It was yeah, through the anthropology yeah, department, yeah. yeah. But I had gotten an internship at the Tribal Arts Gallery, which doesn't oh. any longer. Do you remember that on yes. 10th Street? Amazing place. Yeah. And I had theoretically had an internship there, so I came here for that and walked in and day one and it fell apart. Um, so, um, but there was a whole 10th Street story here. <laughs> of <laughs> yeah, course. That was on 10th Street. Well, I ended up getting another job in another gallery down the street called Gallery Street. Gallery Africaine. Um, okay. and, uh, um, yeah. Very interesting woman who became a big part of our lives in the early years. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and, um, and she she had that, that gallery and it, that gallery, um, she started showing contemporary art and moved, moved the gallery to 57th Street and did some amazing exhibits right. there. So wow. that was my startup. Um, and doing exhibits really, mm -hmm. that, you know, in, in gallery situations. And she also promoted yeah. my artwork and gave me my first exhibits here in New York. Um, so, yeah. Um, so how did this um, woman influence you? Her, her name was Lisa Ludlow Highland. Mm -hmm. And is she yeah. still with us? We or? don't know. We don't we, know. We you lost, lost tra yeah, track lost of her. her. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's interesting that um, this connection with African art, because I have it too. So, um, a lot of African art, a lot of what's created is based on deities right. and, mm -hmm. and um, traditional religion. Mm -hmm. And I always feel it is interesting to me that you studied it, that you ended up in two African art galleries on 10th Street. Mm -hmm. The 10th mm -hmm. Street is where you ended up. I, I believe that the um, spirits or whatever you want to call the deities take care of us and, and call to us. Yeah, yeah. 
Yes, mm -hmm. I, no, I agree. And 10th Street is definitely like, there's something about 10th Street. <laughs> what <laughs> is in there? Yeah, you, right? yeah. <laughs> our guest last week, Dan Sheppy, who's doing um, the Village Fair. I don't know if you're aware of that from September 10th mm -hmm. to the 24th. It's called the Village Trip Fair, also lives on 10th Street. Yes. So this is two weeks in a row. People yeah. are on 10th Street. Yeah. I don't know what it all means. Maybe I should buy that lotto ticket mm -hmm. and just <laughs> maybe, maybe, or or a horse sits the mm -hmm. the number ten. Um, um, both, Wendy, Wendy, real quick, can you just push the computer back just maybe about an inch because yeah. we keep we keep losing Wendell a little bit. Okay, push it I'm back, back backward back. away okay. from Al me. Alex there you go. That's it. Yeah, I just don't want him to okay. slip out of frame. So. There Tim, I told you we needed the crazy glue for this. Yeah. <laughs> if they were like stuck to their seats, it wouldn't be an issue. How, uh, perfect. how are we? Perfect. Are we perfect? Kind of perfect. Uh -huh. So uh, you both, it's interesting, you both have uh, backgrounds in African art. Now, you also I, worked I, at the museum. Uh, museum for African Art? Yeah. Yes, I did. I um, work at the Brooklyn Museum and the Brooklyn Children's Museum as well. Mm. And I teach a course in African art currently ah. at, at the new school. And oh, nice. um, so um, initially I didn't like African art and <laughs> I preferred Native American art, especially the art of the Northwest Coast. Oh, interesting. Um, but um, the more I got into African art, the more I began to get it. You got and it. Finally okay. got it. And of course, I, I think I have a role in that part too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's a big influencer, this Wendell. What was it that you didn't like about African art? Um, I don't know. I, I, I didn't dislike it. I just thought that Native American, especially Northwest Coast art, was more sophisticated. Um, okay, so uh, uh, this really interests me, this okay. conversation. What is it about uh, that art of Native Americans that you feel is more sophisticated? Is it how they draw the lines or? Yeah, the, the, um, their, their system of creating forms. Sometimes the forms are... Mm happen to um to accommodate a box or accommodate a hat or accommodate a cape right and the way they could take an animal and play it out to um to accommodate what their the art is on the use of color also impressed me at that time but the more i got into african art and also had an argument with elisa <laughs> about this because elisa is selling this work african art i'm saying Native American work, work is better. And she said, no, it isn't. No, it isn't. And then finally I got it. I said, oh, once I started teaching it and understand the culture and understanding what the, yeah, intent, yeah. Of the culture yeah. and intent yeah. of the artwork is that yeah. they're not trying to do what Native Americans are doing. Absolutely you know, not. You know, no, that's, that's interesting. You know, yeah. Um, they're trying to show the invisible. They're trying to show power right. and the many aspects of power. Right. Um, there are you, this is a tool for healing or for protection or, you know, uh -huh. you, you totally got it, I got it. but it's yeah. a cultural difference. That's is, why. Yeah. And, and yeah. often our, our cultural differences will manifest in the artistic right. work that we do. Right. And, that's, and I, I said, oh, it, it's not an inability to create or inability to draw or to make forms. Um, Africans artists tend to, um, use asymmetry in order to not make the object dead. Right. Um, mm -hmm. The object is still living. Symmetry is a dead, dead thing for them. Um, classical, but, um, any, if you have one side that's exactly like the other, right. that's a dead object. Right. You know, but symmetry in Native American art is an underlying theme. It is. Yeah. You know, it's so intrinsic to that, right. that kind of art. Yeah. But I find it, I find it very interesting how you could not necessarily feel the African art, but once you were taught and opened your mind to it, then you could feel it. Yes, I could see what was uh -huh. being done and why That's it was done this way. Uh huh. And I, pre I begin to appreciate the invention and the use of materials in such a surprising way. Um, I don't know. It, you know, it, it just struck me one day. Oh, I understand it. It's almost like. Uh -huh. So I have to say this, I didn't like um, 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 African-American music either. Um, and then suddenly one day on the porch, I was standing there and Aretha Franklin was singing, ah. uh, Feel Like a Natural Woman. It oh, just, yeah. It was like, <laughs> like a stroke of lightning. <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 
I, I, to I totally love that that song. It is um, interesting, the dichotomy of the cultures. and mm -hmm. But I think at this point in your life, you probably would gi give each one equal billing. Am I correct? Um, in terms mean, of their greatness, uh, African art versus it, Native American art, and their differences it, and their greatness. Yes, they're yeah. both great and they're quite different and it's unfair to compare them right um, it's right it's yeah. unfair right yeah, because because both are ancient right yeah they're both ancient cultures that that have developed in two completely different ways right yeah. and yeah. but they are doing two two different things right uh, native america especially the northwest coast they are basically dealing with family mm -hmm. um they are dealing with ancestry and the events in the life of a person and the things that that person have encountered and overcome um that the wonderful um uh, story about a totem pole figure with a white minister on it. Love it. And the minister was so proud of the fact that Native Americans were showing his face on their totem poles. Mm -hmm. And what he didn't understand is that the reason you're up there is that you try to convert them and they they were not converted. Uh -huh. is, so they carved, <laughs> they they carved like, your face they, into a totem pole. And basically, to basically say, do not trust this guy. <laughs> we, I, we were not conquered by you. We were yes. not converted yes. by you. Right. This, is mm -hmm. a, this is a danger overcome. You know, so interesting. it's interesting what you're saying because then that is in the here and now and in the current. And many of the African pieces, um, if we go to the carved pieces, the, the heads or many of those things contain, or it is believed it contains the spirit of the person that is no longer with us. And that's where the power comes from. Um, yeah, um, <laughs> certain pieces. Certain pieces. For, for that purpose. Right. Yeah. Other pieces are working in other ways, but they're all dealing with power. It all deals with power. power. Um, it all deals with power in nature, power in material in the world. Um, everything in the world has power. There is nothing without power. This is true. And um, whether it's a bird's egg or bird's dropping, each one has yeah. power. And, I mean, and you have to know how to assemble that. Right. Being a uh, medicine man, you can assemble this and create an object that is charged in power. Right. And can be used to protect you can be used to protect the village, can be used to bring down an enemy. So everything's about power. Right. It's so interesting. Would but you if, say that many pieces are charged? Any any working piece is charged. Any working piece is any, charged. Any piece that is in this useless. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so it, I collect some of this mm -hmm. because I spend a lot of time on West uh, they're, they're, they're charged. <laughs> Shango, Shango is god the god of, of thunder, thunder right. um, and power. Shango has followed me through my life for, well, here's that number 45. For 45 years, Shango has followed me through my life. And often there's there'll be a piece I'm attracted to, whether it's there or here. I get I get the piece home, and lo and behold, I'll look on the bottom of it, or if it comes with a description. <laughs> It's Shango. I have five Shango yeah, pieces. Right. Uh, and I believe, I totally believe this. Shango took me through Nigeria. Mm -hmm. Shango has been with me my in, entire life. That's why I'm asking you about the charging of the, these pieces. Um, I, think a, I think your personal connection to the Shango figure is basically, basically is where your mind is part of it. And in a way, you're protected by it. But that's a very personal. But it's a personal I, thing, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, I've written a play about it. Did you, yeah. you did? Yes, I did. Oh, my God. And so, Shango, <laughs> see, I did exactly what I said. Shango is following me through my life. <laughs> Leon, here today, we were going to talk about his artwork, and now we've gone down the rabbit hole. <laughs> Tim, why does this always happen? I don't know why. It's yeah, I, so I, I want to make yeah. one point about African art that I, I think is yes. very important. African artists have been shortchanged and kind of screwed by um, the marketplace. I agree. They, the same person who um, basically make an object that is charged and used in the community, also are making objects that are for trade for tourists yeah it's the same artists yeah it is but the object that is used in ritual is more important 
right. than the object mm -hmm. that are used for tours. Right. Because of how the market is set up and how people's attitude about African art and what it should be. There is a attitude that if an object is not used in ritual, it's not authentic. Right. Mm -hmm. The difference in Native American art, you got to the Northwest Coast, the artists who make objects there write their name on it, just like Western <laughs> artists. And they sell it because of them being an artist, known as an artist. It's their work. It's their work. Their work. African mm -hmm. artists, can, artists cannot do it, so they get involved in counterfeiting their objects, putting them in chicken coops and making them dirty and smoking them. Right. and to making make them, them look like an, an antiquity. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And it's really unfair. I can, yeah, it, yeah. it is. I mean, that, that is such um, insight. I will tell you that the fact that they'll sell, the things they sell to tourists, this is something I think I believe in. If you don't know the history of it, if you're buying it because it'll look good in your house, you don't um, put any personal belief into the energy of the object. Therefore, right. if I have something from a traditional healer, if I have it, and say there's five pieces mm -hmm. and traditional healer is selling these, but if I have it and it's an authentic piece, it's going to be charged. For the other person, it may not be. What do you think about that? I think you shouldn't you shouldn't have an object that is charged. You think you shouldn't have an object? Because you, you're not strong enough to handle it. Oh, my God, Leon, I'm loaded <laughs> with him. What's going to happen? <laughs> <laughs> loaded with these things. How did I make it? <laughs> you, know, you know what? I'm... Um, being that we started with this conversation, I'd like to start with um, eight eight pieces we have from your show here, okay. and and talk about them uh, using the elements of of water and and figure and and birds in them, and they actually have. Um, ow, I'm sitting on it. You're, you're <laughs> of course I am. Uh, it's called the water in place, and I'm going to hold it up to the camera, but you can't. Chauncey, let's see the slideshow. Yeah, I was right just going to say, yeah, we've got it. Yeah, we have it. Okay. Okay. Um, this is one of a series called The Baptistries. And um, here I'm playing, I, it, this is not Christian art, and, and but it is about Christianity. And it's like, almost like the totem pole um, figure I was referring to, where you, you are dealing with conversion. Okay. Um, basically, the person with the back to you is tattooed and is a pagan. The person facing us is basically a priest. And what he has on his lap is a book that is open with a pattern in it. And that pattern is the same pattern that's on the back of the figure. There. Wow. So as if he is trying to understand the, the pagan. Um, and again, there's this tension between the world, the pagan world, and the world right. of, of Christianity here. Mm -hmm. The um, font itself is being held up by angels. And the basically what this issue is about, what the painting is about, is about shapes that will invoke stories. This is not an illustration of a story. This is not me illustrating something that happened. This is me giving the viewer forms that will allow them to create their own story. To create their own story, right, right from, from your piece. Right, uh, and, and, and many of my paintings are like that. They're not, a, um, a, they're not illustrating a story. I am using forms and figures in order to evoke in people um, their own narrative. You're like, actually what, what you right, think? having what? them create their own narrative from your work. Right. Wow, I, I never thought about that. Wait a bit. This is um, um, the Baptist. Oh, it's called King Fisher of John and Jesus. And it's a play on the, again, baptism. And this is the first baptism. And it's a play on um, a number of things going on. You have above a King Fisher rather than a dove. And it's a double play or a triple play on the idea of Christ being the king of the Jews. So he's a fisher in that sense. And also he was, his, uh, his um, apostles were fishermen. He was a, uh, king, a, fish, right. he was a fisher as well. So he's a king, he's a fisher. Um, what you have at the bottom are three fish, and that refers to the, the miracle of the fish and the loaves and fishes. The lo right, loaves, loaves right. of fishes. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have the sun in the background, again, a king uh, symbol. Um, and uh, I think basically Christ is without eyes. It's almost like he's a puppet. The figure is like wow. he's a, 
uh, string puppet there, and he's uh, being baptized. And he's being baptized again. Right. Baptism. Okay. Wow. Yeah, those are incredible. They're absolutely incredible. All right. Now the next one coming up. Um, I kind of put them in. Chauncey. Uh, yeah, he's got it there. there um, oh. I love. I love this. Yeah, me too. This is. Mm -hmm. uh, I love all of them. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, they're one, really wonderful pieces. This is a series called One with Great Birds, and I was thinking a lot about this. I said, where did that idea come from? And I remember there was a painting or a photograph of um, someone sitting in the Mexican marketplace and turkeys had been bound and set out in front of them. That's what they do, right? right. They had chickens and turkeys. turkeys. Yeah. And I said, oh, that's where that idea came from. I have done this a long time ago when I was batiking. I did a form of it in batik. Nothing as complicated as this. And <clears throat> also it's influenced by Chinese paintings um, the Chinese um, yeah. landscape in the background there um, is going going on. I even and there's a little bit of Jap Jap Japanese artwork with the sake bottle, and he's on oh, the yeah, roof of, of a house, and there's a, a body of water with a boat in the background. Again, there's, these are about forms. Right. Mm -hmm. This is back to my um, Baptist uh, baptistry um, uh, figures. In fact, one of the most fascinating part of the Catholic Church to me, to, for me as a pagan is... is <laughs> Wait, that is like, I, I love that sentence. The most fascinating thing about the Catholic Church for me as a pagan. That's great. Is, is the baptismal um, area and the baptismal font. Mm -hmm. and they, they are so varied and so wonderfully done sometimes. And so this is what I'm playing on. Again, we have two pagans here. Um, one is reaching for a book um, on the, again, mm -hmm. my right. Um, and then the other one is looking out a window, seeing a green parrot fly by. The tension here is between uh, paganism and nature, and they're brought into this church where they're going to be maybe baptized, convinced to be, but one may be, but the other one is looking to, the, to um, nature. Right. Um, being drawn uh -huh. away from the situation again <clears throat> and then there's a lamp that's in the form of a seashell right all, all of this is basically evoking um a story from story. the viewer right mm -hmm. uh this one is uh, this is just being silly um <laughs> <laughs> this is fishing with angelic friend i love that uh, mm. so you have a fisherman and he's evidently has a friend who's an angel and they and he convinced the angel to fish with him so you know it's just basically turning maybe a Christian idea on its head and making it um, something else, right. something fun mm -hmm. or, and um, something that, you know, what story could be connected with this? You know, what? Well, I love that. Yeah. And here's, a, here's a, another example of the, from the same series, Fishing with Angelic Friend, friend Number Two. Mm -hmm. um, and what I'm trying to show here is a wave that is breaking in such a way that's covering the bottom of the sun and the fisherman is caught a fish and the angel in the background is discovering whether he has a fish or not so mm -hmm. but the, it, it's interesting the fisherman's got the fish but the angel it's really pretty undecided it's left up to the viewer right. to decide mm -hmm. this is again back to the series one with great birds again the balcony um overlooking a body of water with your um, chinese mountains in the background and the great bird is just walking past. Mm -hmm. Wow. With attitude. With that attitude. bird has attitude. <laughs> <laughs> it's just strutting. It's yeah. Wow. Uh, this is my favorite of the great birds, or one of the great birds series, because of the attitude of the birds. It's, it's in this moment when it's going to bring the wings down. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're going to um, enjoy that. Actually, I finished this, and I did not like the figure, and I had to redo the figure um, again. Um, and uh, again, another challenge was to get um, the sense of moonlight on a body of water, which was kind of challenging as well. Um, again, this is the same balcony scene with the figure and um, the great bird. In the case, I have swapped out the uh, turkeys for water birds again yeah me, uh, keeping my theme going of water water related ideas right. 
Well, kingfishers, as you know, are water birds, water birds right? Birds, and yeah. um, what kind of bird is this? That's this a crane. Is, it is a crane. That's yeah. what I thought. Mm -hmm. I love cranes. I now, Marshall to cranes. <laughs> now, Leon, Leon, what are your inspirations or to come up with an idea? Do you uh, maybe see something somewhere that moves you? Or yeah. wondered this it's also. Question, yeah. <laughs> What's um, that? I always wonder the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> Well, sometimes it's seeing something, yes, um, but often it's ideas. Um, uh -huh. They can come out of an idea. Um, I have, um, uh, it has many different sources. Mm -hmm. um, I enjoy reading science fi fiction and fantasy, mm -hmm. and sometimes right. it comes from that. Yeah. Sometimes it's looking at um, Japanese and Chinese paintings. Mm -hmm. um, Native um, African sometimes is, uh, uh, art sometimes inspire me, mm -hmm. uh, but it often is just an idea. I'm, I sometimes an idea will rattle around in my head for the longest time. I, I, I don't know if you know of tea stories, but tell me what are those? These are stories from the Japanese tea culture. Okay, right, and, the tea culture. And there are these are very short stories, and um, sometimes an idea like. Um, um, two friends, one is invited the other to tea. It's in the middle of winter, and one goes out to meet his friend he sees coming, and he has an incense burner in his hand to warm his hand and warm his friend's hands. But his friend has one also when they meet. And basically, it's kind of like, oh, these are two people who think alike or right. thinking the same thing. Mm -hmm. How do I turn that into a painting? Uh, this is somehow yeah, right. this is how sometimes right. my paintings occur. How uh -huh. do I put figures together to get across that idea? Yeah, and it's and it's interesting too that you will do in in a, a series, like a a, a series uh, of paintings. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. yes, I will. I haven't always done that. Um, I am using gouache on black paper, and that comes out of mm -hmm. um, basically working with children. I discovered in doing children's workshops they, they are sometimes they so often work on white or brown paper in their schoolroom they've never dealt with black right and they're surprised with how the color jumps mm -hmm. how, in uh, interesting. How, how, yeah. how it makes their work so much more serious yeah and so that started me doing that i had come up with a number of tricks with children in doing artwork i, I had um, at carey school i had relay races where i put a, up an object i love this and have two teams and they would run to the easel, try to draw the object, tear off the paper, and run back. I think and that's so, quite, Tim, how brilliant an exercise! I love that. <laughs> they, they would not. Now, they would never think that they have to hesitate over anything. They right. would do it as quickly as possible. Uh -huh. what I would get would be stunning. You couldn't tell whether an adult did or a child did. I love it. Now, um, uh, where? How can people find out more about your about your artwork? Um, they can go to leonwaller.com and they'll be taken to a website that mm -hmm. uh, talks about my artwork. And there's a link there also to go to a um, store that sells um, my, oh, great. some of my artwork and also prints. Uh huh. And <laughs> now, Wendell, we have not forgotten about you. No, nope, okay. we have. We have <laughs> I've got a whole lot of wondering. stuff I want to talk to you. I have a lot of stuff I want to talk to you about as well. Jim Henson exhibit at uh, the Museum yes, of the Moving Image. Yes, I think on the screen there. You yeah, the, yeah. Uh -huh. First of all, who doesn't love Jim Henson? Oh, right, the Muppets. Yeah, <laughs> and he was obviously an incredible person. And I, I knew that already, but I've, I've come to realize that more through the people I've met that worked with him. All of them, each of them, amazing right. people. I mean, it's it's an amazing world, really incredible. He world. left us too soon. Oh, definitely, yeah. yeah. But you know, it's amazing. Um, as I say, you get together with a group of people who work with him, and it's like he's there. Right. They, uh -huh. they, they thought so highly of him, I think, and and he had such an impact on them that he's still yeah. he's, his presence is still there. His standards are it. still there. His priorities are still there. It's it's been an amazing experience for me over the last ten years, really. Um, and what a way to end my my life at Museum Moving Image by starting that. So you have been there <laughs> for 30 years? Well, I was a uh, deputy director at the museum for the last 20 years. Oh, I was wow. consultant huh? on and off throughout the 90s. I, I first um, worked there um, to do it when the museum had just opened. And I did the first art exhibition of an artist named Shigeko Kubota. Um, that was back in 1989. 89, 90, yeah, so <laughs> around that era. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, it, it was a 
the show was uh, successful and the museum kept calling me back to do other projects. <laughs> when do we want you back? Do, um, we'll consulting things here and there. And then um, the, uh, I guess it was about 98 or so, the director approached me about doing a, um, an overhaul of the core exhibition, helping to um, oversee that. And I, I started that project and by the end of it, it was supposed to be a three month project, it ended up being a two year project. <laughs> and at the end of it, I was deputy director of the museum. <laughs> Isn't that the case? Now, here are some examples. Yeah. Tell us about so, this one. Well, this is sort of my 15 minutes in life. Um, back in, right after I did that initial exhibition at, at Museum of Moving Image, well, actually right before that, sorry, that's how they heard about me. I was selected to design the official US exhibition at the Sao Paulo Biennale. Oh, um, so this is and, from yeah, Sao Paulo, wow. Yeah. This is the work of Martin Purrier. And Kelly Jones was the American, the curator of the American exhibit. And I was really honored when she called me. I had worked with her on some other small projects. And she was at Jamaica Art Center at the time. And it was also amazing that Jamaica Art Center was chosen to do the official U.S. exhibition. Wow. And, and it's it usually, Paulo, usually right. been, like, giant museums and big, bigger, bigger yeah. organizations. But it was all very exciting. And um, so I, um, I spent some time in Brazil with with Martin and um, and his brother, who um, Michael Purrier, who um, worked with me on doing the whole installation, and it was it was quite an experience. Um, I don't know how much you know about the Biennale project, but it's no, um, I don't. it's uh, it happens every two years. It's been going on since I think the late forties, early fifties. Well, hmm. It followed the original Venice Biennale, which has gone on. Since that I that I knew about. I didn't so, know yeah, about the one in yeah, Sao Paulo. Yeah, Sao Paulo started wow. up, and now there, of course the Biennale is all over the place. But they, those are the yeah. two. The, the, so Venice was the original, and Sao Paulo was the second major one. But um. Yeah, just doing the, the project with there with um, right. artists from other countries and um, everybody, you know, working together. Um, a lot of craziness, but a lot of good things that came it's out of it. It's good craziness, so it's that happened. <laughs> but working with Martin Purrier was was the most amazing part of it all. Mm. Okay, now here we just jump back to we, the Sesame we, Street. Yeah, to Jim Henson, yeah. <laughs> back to Jim Henson. This is actually from the traveling version of Jim Henson. Oh, look. And that's what I'm still doing. I, I actually retired from using the moving image last yes. summer. Uh, but I'm now consulting to them, and I've continued to manage the traveling exhibition. So uh, it's you're been taking care of Bert and Ernie there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, this show opened in Seattle um, about three years, four years ago, back 2017. Is that uh, maybe that's five years ago? It, yeah. Well, the pandemic <laughs> took some flies. time away yeah. from us, right? We, but it's, it, went, it opened in Seattle. It went to Los Angeles. It went to Meridian, Mississippi, Columbus, Ohio, Albuquerque, mm -hmm. New Mexico, Omaha, Nebraska. <laughs> Detroit, all and, now the, all, and now it's in, in San Francisco, uh, yeah, and you're still yeah. consulting on it, which yeah, is great. Yeah, yeah, it'll be in Grand Rapids, Michigan next. We're, the, we're jumping Grand back Park now Museum. to uh, Sao Paulo again. Yeah, this is yeah. part of that whole installation that you did there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I should, I should also say that you remember you had the issue with the Cubans? Oh, yeah, tell us. Right. We love a good story. <laughs> well, we, I'm not sure I'm to talk about that on television. No, now. you can't. You, you can't. Well, Live stream. It's different than regular TV. Yeah, no. I, I, well, the Biennale. I, you know, I, I um, we got there early, and I got Martin's exhibition in early. And some other countries were having problems. Um, uh, the Israeli um, artist had a lot of problems, and I assisted him. But I also befriended the Cuban delegation. Martin and I did. The artist and I. I'm sure they and were they, fun. Yeah, they were great. Yeah. And uh, the U.S. consulate did, was not happy about that. <laughs> Are you kidding me? All well, right, you know, but we, you were, just... we were not friendly at all then. But um, I don't know how it would play out now. But it was it was it was sort of interesting. But they but really the reacted. Time, You're here all yeah. at the same show, and and we, we someone not, gave yeah. you grief about it. What yeah. did they say to you? Just you know, you should not you know be going there. Stay away from that. Like, Stay we away from like, the Cuban well, artists. We invited the, the artists to the uh, our party at the consulate. Yeah, of course you they did. They came, of course, and you know it was all okay. It all worked out. It but I, but in spite of that, I got a very nice letter of recommendation from them, and you know, raving for right. me, my work and and my you know my diplomatic skills. Well, I was, I was going to say this and... is using art <laughs> for diplomacy. That's right. That's is right, it, that's is right, that not that's why right. we would use that's art? Right. You yeah, know. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, this, this is a, um, what, what my last exhibition at uh, Museum of Moving Image before my retirement, uh, envisioning 2001 Stanley Kubrick Space Odyssey. Get out! Just open and it was amazing. I mean, uh, for me, uh, 2001 uh, Space Odyssey was such an incredible film for me when I saw it. Mm -hmm. uh, my family had come to New York. You know, I'm from Mississippi, originally, right? And we had come to New York and had just opened, and my father took me to see it at the. Grand Cinema, the Lowe's that's no longer exists. Right, um, it was on Broadway. I was, was John, grand. So John, the theater John. was amazing in itself. The but then, of it. yeah, 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 was, yeah. Anyway, so it was a major. Like it's always been my favorite film ever, and um, it was amazing for me to end by my twenty year 
career at Museum of Living Image with that exhibition. How right? Yeah. How ironic, yeah. really, when you yeah. think about it. Yeah. You know. Well, and to meet um, um, you know, um, Kathleen Kubrick and um, um, uh, Pierre Delay, and to meet some Pierre of the Delay. I've heard I, is Joe I have, is I have a pictures trip. of him. I mean, you know, those together. You know, it's like yeah. It was amazing. It was really incredible. incredible. And the show was about the making of the film and right. how, um, what um, what he what was what all the research that went into it and that Cooper did. And that's very challenging. Yeah. That you had to create an exhibit and really learn all of that because you weren't there when they made the film. So yeah. basically, everything is being given to you, yeah. and then you have to come up with this incredible exhibit. Well, yeah, now this exhibit had actually existed in Germany. Previously. Okay. So this, so what we reformed it. You, re you had to reform and, that, it probably. Yeah. Well, I had an amazing colleague, Barbara Miller, who's okay. a um, curator at Museum Movie Image, um, and she's she's still there, <laughs> holding the fort down. Hi. But mm -hmm. Barbara and I went through many, many um, amazing projects together in the last 10 years. Um, um, Matthew Weiner's Mad Men. Um, right, you did Mad Men there. Um, yeah, and Scorsese. Scorsese, um, um, we did some incredible exhibitions, but 2001 was, you know, for me, was very, very special. Now, mm. when you did, um, I have to ask you about this one that you did, how cats took over the internet. What, what, what can you describe, <laughs> right, Tim? How much do you love that? Yeah. Tell us about that. Well, it was an amazing little experiment, a little project that we did. We had envisioned it, and I, my colleague Jason Ethnick was the curator of it um, at the time. And um, Jason came up with this idea. Um, and we, you know, it was a small exhibit. I mean, it was basically in what we call our, our amphitheater gallery at the Museum of Moving Image, um, which is like a, you know, I don't know, 500 square foot space or so. It's very small. So it was all projections, but it was just an incredible hit. People just loved it. They poured out on um, people brought their, their, their cats there to see Stop. it. Stop! And we had um, museums from around the world approaching us about bringing it there. And um, unfortunately it was, it was not a very travelable exhibit because it was all right. like, there were rights issues and all that sort of stuff. So but tell us, um, I'm very was, interested just, in this. So what was it? Videos of people's cats doing cat just, things? Yeah, or? the selection and the, the um, Jason had done little groupings of them, sort of thematic groupings. And um, so there were little film clips all projected on the wall. And the other thing about it that my colleagues, I mean, my colleague at the time um, uh, came up with uh, was projecting all this. So it was, there was, um, there were some parts that were on the wall. There were shapes on the wall, but all the content was projected on into the. So shapes. everything was a projection. It was, yeah, so it was, it, then that made it easier to do. In one way, it was a nightmare right. to put together those projections. Well, I, but, I would um, imagine. In the physical space, it, it allowed a lot of flexibility in terms of what we had on the walls, and so they could even mm -hmm. be updates to some of the content um, if we wanted. You know, because we had Amazing. Set, set areas where the projections happened. No, it was, it was technically it was a it was an interesting project, but it was just it just amazed us how what a hit it was and how how people mm -hmm. just loved it. And, I um, would imagine. Yeah. yeah. You, you um, could do it with any animal, actually. I'm thinking how dogs took over the internet. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm, all, I'm all off on a tangent. I'm on all those sites. Right, a lot of ideas come out. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> but um, thank you, everyone, for tuning in. You're watching If These Walls Could Talk with your hosts, Wendy Stewart and Tim Moss, and our wonderful and special guests, Leon Waller and Wendell Walker. Yes. Now, <laughs> Wendell, to put together an exhibit, because you've worked at museums, and uh, uh, galleries and alternative spaces and, and private right. individuals. You know, private, or, or private yeah. Like, I'm, I mean, I, as far as the installations go, there is are so many variables and details to yeah. putting one together. Everything from even like climate control in, in yeah, some places yeah. Yeah. To, to the actual moving uh, the the exhibit in or the pieces in yeah to i mean how how do you even begin to yeah. <laughs> well firstly select because yeah, yeah, somebody yeah. says i've got paintings or i've got sculptures right. well we want to put it on in here yeah where do you even begin to organize all of that that's so yeah, much it's a great question the, I would... the, the curator is the important person alongside me um the curator who has the idea for the exhibition and the, and the, the storyline that will be uh, told mm -hmm. through the exhibition and uh, has theoretically selected all the works, although sometimes um, I would get involved in that depending on the project because wow. there are space Curation constraints, too. there are there are budget constraints, there are environment right. constraints sometimes to to different objects coming into a space, and depending on where the objects being uh, borrowed from, um, you know, all the the the, the right. terms of that loan have to be adhered to. So right. I've always loved what I do because I, I 
it put the, the exhibition designer and a lot of people didn't know about exhibition design. don't even know that there was such a field as that. But right. As I was in the middle of it all. So you, you, and we, when I would go in, a museum hires me to do an exhibit. There is the curator who's developed the idea of this, of this show. They developed the but idea. But I've also got yeah. to think about their security concerns. I've got to think about yeah. their education programs and how many school groups are going to bring through mm -hmm. and how they're going to use those school groups in the space. Um, I've got to think about conservation concerns and um, how objects need to be um, put together or how they need to be housed to protect mm -hmm. them. Right. And then with right. all those things, I got to pull that together and tell, tell, tell the story that the curator wants to exactly. tell. Exactly, right. You in, in the presentation. You yeah, have to, both yeah. creative and nuts and bolts. Yeah, absolutely. And so you have to have, a, you know, to write, like the organizational skills. Yeah, right. You have to have, but also the, the creativity to mm -hmm. make it to make it work. Yeah. Have you um ever dealt with in an exhibit uh, challenges of dealing with the public or what kinds of things? Oh, because then you'd probably have a security. <laughs> Security would be a part of that yeah. too. Yeah, yeah, no, and, and securing objects so that you don't interfere with the object right. is always the right. desire. Secure, That's sometimes right. really hard to do. Mm -hmm. um, and at Museum of Movie Image, we we um in our core exhibition there, we often would take a little more risk with some of the objects because we just didn't want to interfere with them. Um, and we had very few incidents. Of, you had, of that's what I was going to ask, right? I mean, Interesting. There were a couple way back, but I won't, mm -hmm. I won't go into details of them. Yeah. <laughs> 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 um, but no, we, you know, there's always that balancing act. And of course, uh, it is a balancing act because somebody's really determined to do something. You know, they've, they're finding ways to do it. So how far right. do you want to go with security measures? Right. Uh, and of course, security is is backed up not only by mounts and the objects, but by, by camera coverage and the guards and all that. And there's uh -huh. a psychological element to all that when when I think when most people know that things are being watched, they're, they're right. not as inclined. Mm -hmm. Right. So all that be uh, becomes a part of it, how you how you package right. it all and put it all together. And, and in a moving image, it could be their moving image on a camera. <laughs> yes. uh, so don't you dare move and touch that. <laughs> that thing. Yeah, but that's I just find that so that's fascinating. Exactly all of the the from from oh let's just let's do this show of this artist yeah. to actually opening the door and letting the public in. There yeah. are so yeah. many yeah. variables between and, those two points and of course leon's installation here at pangea required yes. a complete overhaul of the <laughs> the back room with the <laughs> lighting that i put in and right. i'm working with our yeah, that's another thing it's the lighting the right station. they're they're incredible how they, amazing they, team but you yeah. were amazing i watched the day you guys came in here and you were putting that up and you did some lights on alan's paintings here too yeah. i mean you you're just incredible to work with mm -hmm. uh detail oriented and you you know what he does everything with a smile on his face and right? the fact that you're from Mississippi really? <laughs> you know how they are from Mississippi never let them see you sweat how does, how does a boy from Mississippi end up in this end of the artistic world Oh, that's a really you good didn't, question. You didn't grow up Let's like say. saying, you know, I want to put exhibits together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, well, I, I had an uh, amazing father who um, inspired me and my sisters in many ways. And um, mm -hmm. he, he didn't, um, he, he was very accepting of, of, of what we wanted to do in life. And who, yeah. I mean, he had his vision for me, I think, and it didn't play out the way he thought, but, you know, he accepted my, my version and was really What was his me. vision for you? Oh, I think he imagined me being a lawyer in Mississippi. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> but somehow that was not going to work out. I think, I think we realized now. that pretty early right. on. Also. <laughs> so he was accepting, but the, this talent that you have, you know, the the creative versus the organizational skills. Were you like that as as a kid? Oh yeah, or? yeah. No, I, I was constantly. Uh, my favorite memory when. when um, Trimline phones, telephones. Came yes, out. I love that. that. The slim they were, phones. Mississippi was kind of the last state to get them, but I somehow knew, and I was—I must have been like eight years old or something. And I called up the phone company, had all our phones changed. My parents didn't figure out <laughs> until they arrived. That's <laughs> great. <laughs> changed the phones. I don't know how I figured out the account stuff and all that because I was really young. But I yeah, worked I it all that. out. I and totally love and that. then my, my parents were freaking out when they show up with these phones, and my yeah. mother. Oh well, let him do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I learned all around how to how to you. get things done. You know, like right. yeah, was, <laughs> absolutely, I love it, right. and and fabulous presentation at it at that. <laughs> it to totally great story. So, um, your early years in New York. What were you doing when you left Mississippi, and what was the what was the dream to come here? Well, um, 
well, the dream to come here was, you know, was to, to work in the traditional African American gallery. And right. I thought I was going to go back to graduate school in, at that time in anthropology to study. That, traditional that was my mass. My degree yeah. was in yeah. anthropology. I love that. But, you know, I, I got that job and one thing led to another. And the next thing I knew, I was doing exhibitions all over the place. And of course, uh -huh. the first women's bank, um, who many people don't know about any longer, but the first women's bank was this amazing organization, a bank that existed at 57th and Park Avenue, hmm. the first bank in the world that offered equal. Like did, access I, to credit. Of course, a lot happened with no the laws idea. in the 70s. Right. It's wow. a really interesting area, and it's amazing how recent it is that, that women yeah. have equal access to credit. Right, <laughs> so right. Terrible. But anyway, the, so they the bank was built, and it was a, the idea was that it was going to be a gallery, and that part of it never took off. But um, I, I was involved in a show that happened there, and I made a proposal to them. So from like 1980 to 85, I managed a nonprofit exhibition program there. Wow. And I, I never even these, knew. And I was all, in New all York. These exhibitions and, and you know, so that, that led me into the museum world. And here I am. <laughs> I love it. I love it. There's a much well, longer again, story details in that. But <laughs> again, our guests are Leon Waller and Wendell Walker. We thank you very much for, for uh, taking some time and sharing with us. We now, have how long? Tell us a little bit about the two of you. How long have you been together? <laughs> or well, are you together or what's? We, yeah, we're, we're together somehow. <laughs> somehow, somewhat, somewhere they are together. We heard it right here. And but the, the first Sunday this October will mark our 45th anniversary oh, of meeting at the Whitney in one of that painting that we showed earlier. So uh -huh. yeah, it's been an interesting How cool 45 is that? years. Wow. Um, nice, nice. Lots of nice. ups and downs and in-betweens and back and forth in our, yeah. our, in our 45 years together. But, you know, here we are. <laughs> I love that. But you're like art powerhouses, you know, with, with what you do. And I love showcasing that because that is the very fiber of what New York yeah. is. Yeah, yeah. 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 absolutely. What keeps it going. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, you know, congratulations to both of you for everything that you've done for the, well, thank you. for the arts here. It's, so it's, now... Now, if we could put up their websites again, it's leonwaller.com and wendellwalker.com. Yes. Right. And, and, um, and my site's still in formation, just so you know. <laughs> okay. So Leon, Leon, do you have any projects or any, have you been inspired lately for any, any, any works to emerge or manifest? I, I just, I got a new studio, <coughs> sorry, I got a new studio and I'm just continuing to work. Um, uh -huh. I just finished a new painting um, a week, about a week ago, and um, it's, I just keep working. Uh, there's no, there's no big project right now. Um, uh -huh. I'll go back teaching in the fall at the new school. Uh -huh. I'll be teaching a course called New York Exhibitions, where, I, where students will go to different exhibitions and create a website of their own related nice. to their visits. And I will nice. grade their, that? I will grade their websites, uh -huh. and I teach at the same place a course in African art. Nice, nice. yeah, uh -huh. I, I totally love so it. So I stay busy. <laughs> <laughs> well, more than stay busy. Whenever people say that, they're like, when they say, "Wendy, are you staying busy?" <laughs> I don't like that. I'm creating. <laughs> you are creating. You are continually creating, yeah. and 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 so are you. And that's what Absolutely. it really is uh, about. Well, we have a few a few comments yes, here. Yeah. A scooter Pie from Michigan. Hi. Yeah. Hi, um, our good friend, our good friend Nick Lyon, was say hi everyone. This, these hey, are hey. earlier. Said hi everyone. Have a great show. Sue Stutzman from Massachusetts says hello. Designer, um, amazing designer. Hi. And Billy Hess, I think, was asking photographer Nick, how come you didn't take me with you on vacation to get his because <laughs> <laughs> Nick just got back from I think European. A three weeks. Yeah. Nick took three week, three weeks. Barcelona, yeah. Looks, Lisbon. I yeah, love it. Yeah, Barcelona. Yeah. yeah. And um, Hannah, uh, Wendy's friend, Hannah Q Dance Company These says what? Says what? Fantastic artwork. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nick Lyon also says amazing artwork. Um, B Claudia, um, she's from, from Germany. Germany, and she said um, very interesting. Explored the website. When are you coming to? Germany. <laughs> yeah, that's actually right. We, you know, this exhibit. Hopefully to, soon. Yeah, hopefully <laughs> soon be Claudia. Absolutely. Thank you for asking that. <laughs> yeah, so those are just some of the ones. Oh, and Miss Hera D says, good, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. So good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> well, I just, I want to thank everybody for, for tuning in. And, thank um, you. and again, uh, you're watching If These Walls Could Talk with your hosts, Wendy Stewart and Tim Moss, and our wonderful and incredible and inspiring guests, inspiring, Ron really? Waller and Wendy, Wendell Walker. 
There you so go, Wendy, Wendy Walker. <laughs> <laughs> Wendy, I went. Oh, that's Wendy. Don't give me. <laughs> Oh my God. One's Wendy, one's Wendell. You figure it out. <laughs> oh, he's a Wanda. <laughs> you know, and, and this all came about because, as you know, Tim, incredible things happen at the bar at Pangea. Yes, and yes. Um, Arnaldo introduced me to Wendell and we started talking. And then we lost track of each other. And then I reconnected with you at the bar. And the, yeah. and the, the rest is history. <laughs> Folks, get out there to the best of your ability because you know, we can stay behind our computers and Zoom and StreamYard and all of that. But at the end of the day, some of the most interesting connections happen when you go mm -hmm. out there and you talk to somebody face to face. Absolutely. And we can get back out there again in person. I'm Thank sorry you. I couldn't be there with you today. Um, I'm in the middle of packing. I'm heading back out of town again for the next in the next couple of weeks. So, um, but uh, I, I look forward to meeting the two of you in person you down will, in the yeah. East Village sometime soon. As you will. Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you, you, Tim. Well, Thank you, Leon. Thank, Thank you, Wendell. You. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> See you next week. <laughs>